Chapter Twenty Eight of Pee Wee Harris Adrift. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Pee Wee Harris Adrift by Percy Keith Fitzhugh. Chapter Twenty Eight. It pays to advertise. On Friday night it rained, and the alligators were driven into their tent. It rained all night, and was still raining, when the momentous Saturday dawned. They were compelled to eat breakfast in their tent, the top of which was plastered with apple blossoms, so that the khaki-colored fabric looked not unlike a brown wallpaper with a floral design. The tide being out, the rain pattered down on the surrounding mud in shallow places, and the members of the patrol sat in the open doorway of their cozy little shelter, wistfully gazing at the downpour, and watching the little holes that the raindrops made in the mud. Each drop, like a bullet, drove a little hole in the oozy bottom, which slowly closed up again. Schools of darting killies hurried this way and that, frantically seeking an avenue into the deeper places where puddles would afford them a haven during the lowest ebb. Rain, rain, rain. On the porch of the boathouse, a mile or so downstream, was gathered a group of young fellows, also watching wistfully. Through the intervening space of rain, they seemed like pictures of specters, misty and unsubstantial. "'The lowest ebb is the turn of the tide,' said Townsend cheerily. "'I think when it comes in, it's going to stop raining. That's what I think. It's going to clear up and be warm this afternoon, you see?' Rain before seven, clear before eleven. What do you say we catch some of those killies and fry them? That's what you call an inspiration, said Roly-Poly. They caught some killies with a bent pin and fried them, and they were not half bad. Along about eleven o'clock the tide began running up. The killies, which had not been lured to their undoing, disappeared in the swelling water, and soon the ripples danced up over the mud, submerging it entirely. The river began to be attractive again, and then the sun came out. "'This is going to be some peach of a tide for races,' said Townsend. "'It'll be good and full after such an all-night rain.' At two o'clock, when the river was about half full, a launch came chugging up from the boat club, bringing a flag and the young fellow who was to be posted at the turning point. He planted the flag on its tall standard near the shore, and settled down to mind his own business. Pee-wee received him as if he were a foreign ambassador. Our hero was now so intent upon his commercial enterprise that he forgot all about the races, except in their commercial aspect. The island was but the turning point for the contestants, and seemed detached from the excitement and preparations which prevailed down at the clubhouse. Soon, along the shore, there began to be visible little groups of boys, sprawling on the grass, waiting. The boathouse porch and the adjacent float were filled with high school pupils. They made a great racket, and from all the noise and bustle thereabouts, the little island seemed removed, as if a part of the events, and yet not a part. Presently a little group of girls appeared at the edge of Gilroy's Field, which was the nearest point on the mainland to Alligator Island. They seemed to be looking about in a bewildered, inquiring sort of way. Evidently the advertising was bringing results. It seemed as if they might have banded together, as girls will, for the cut-rate crews, which they had seen advertised. At all events, they seemed to be strangers. Whoever they were, it spoke well for their adventurous spirit, that they should wish to book passage to an unknown shore, when there were no others in sight who seemed the least interested in the voyage. "'Is that Alligator Island?' one of them called. "'It certainly is,' Townsend answered. I'll come over and get you. The boat is leaving right away. Have your fares ready, Pee-wee called in a voice of thunder. As Townsend approached the mainland, there was much whispering and giggling among the girls. We came from Edgemer, said one of them. We're in the Edgemer High School, and we came over on the trolley to see the Bridgeboro High School beaten. We saw a small boy in the street with a sign. That was me, shouted Pee-wee. I saw you on Main Street. Have your fares ready, and he'll bring you over. All aboard. 
all aboard to alligator island with its tropic vegetations and boat races and in his excitement and enthusiasm he added step this way step right this way did you ever hear such a thing laughed one girl he means after you step out of the boat said townsend you would have thought that Wee was selling desert islands out of a basket he stood on the extreme edge nearest to the field shouting here you are this way for your desert isle see the tropic variations he means vegetation said townsend he means fresh vegetables called brownie here you are for your fresh vegetables Wee shouted hardly knowing what he said at this actual prospect of business which he saw before his very eyes the races encircle this island here you are for the best seats come early and avoid the rush that's the wild man of the island townsend said he's perfectly harmless step right in the boat they were rowed over and escorted to seats where they did not have to wait long for scarcely were they settled on one long bench when a chorus of shouts arose down at the boathouse as out into the river shot two canoes oh they're coming they're coming the girls caroled in great excitement and anticipation oh look do look one of them said clutching the shoulder of her neighbor he's in the red canoe it's william doddle and he's ahead hurrah for edgemer oh he's coming he's coming i knew we'd annihilate them i just knew it oh it's simply glorious hurrah for bridgeboro shouted peewee hurrah for edgemer shouted the girls the two canoes with edgemer a little ahead as well as they could see came gliding up the river two streaks red and green in the sunshine end of chapter twenty eight recording by john brandon